Yes. Welcome everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you, uh, with all of you. Um, Oscar, I'm going to ask you to watch the the chat for any questions and you got let it. me know as I'm going to be close in the chat so I can um, share my screen for a minute here. So I will invite everyone actually to uh, begin thinking uh, or or noting any questions that you may have. Um, I also want to let you know that I may not be well versed in particular fields that we are going to be talking about in a minute, but I did want to show it to you so that you can actually have it in your mind. So kind of a disclaimer here is um, this is a panoramic view of the human service and it is highly recommended, must indeed, actually for you to look into each of the programs independently because they vary between universities and universities. So you must um, really think about which place you want to continue your education, if you want to, if not, it's fine. But it is very important for me to mention that. This is just a panoramic view of everything that we can do within the human service, academically speaking and professionally speaking as well. Um, so after um, our... Uh open advising, Harard and I were talking about how it went and, you know, what were some highlights that we found interesting in terms of the comments. And there was a big interest into how to get into the field. So Harard thought he'd make his presentation this evening on, um, uh, as he said, a panoramic view of the human services field, what we can do in terms of um, education and training academically and then uh, professional practice. And so this will be, as I understand it, and I'll let Gerardo introduce it, an um, introduction into uh, more information about that, about um, our own field and what we can do in it. That is correct, Oscar. So the interest is huge. And um, part of what we notice is that there is a lack of a sort of an understanding of how this works. And let me tell you, even Oscar and I at this level, there are policies that come out that we need to read over and over and over to ensure that we understand what they are asking us for. So we are just right there with you guys. So that, that's just a disclaimer. Um, you will need to actually indeed research any university or any policy in the governing bodies that takes, that takes care of our profession. But let me start, let me share my screen for a minute and let me know if you guys can see it. Yeah, we can see that you're in full screen and we can see you off to the side, so. Fantastic, so I actually wanted to start with this presentation sharing with you a, a very holistic and, and comprehensive definition of what human services are. So when we think about human service, we think in a particular field and indeed it's a very particular field because we focus on supporting other individuals in, we focus on helping individuals uh, bypass any barriers that they may have. When we think about human service, we always wanted it to categorize it, and it is a huge umbrella. Within human service, um, we can think about psychologists, we can think about um, counselors, we can think about uh, family therapists, we can think about um, school counselors, school psychologists, uh, substance abuse counselors. So human service per se, it's an umbrella term that it's actually, that, that embraces all those different professions that are geared towards supporting the individual's well-being. And this is a key word for all of us. All of the programs within the human service focus on the well-being of the individual. It doesn't matter if you are in social work, or counselor, we are always striving to support the individual's well-being. And this, this well-being can actually be emotional, physical, um, so that, that they can actually feel better. And, and at the end of the day, of course, reach ultimate happiness. So a particular aspect of human services that I wanted it to know to, know to everyone is in, in, in the number two. We promote the delivery of service meaning that we become advocators for those that cannot actually advocate for themselves. This is the beauty of our profession. 
we support others with the skills that we have. Hence, um, the courses that you take within our program, the ethics course, um, uh, um, the intro to counseling, because we need to know how to talk to other people. We need to actually uh, be able to work with individuals in a, a very different way that, that goes beyond a friendship, but really understand the communication process that takes place. Understand, for example, how those systems operate together for the benefit of the, all of, of the individuals. We are indeed called to be advocators. So we are indeed working all together for the well-being of the individual. So human service and per se becomes an umbrella term in which um, all of the other fields that we'll see in a minute are indeed housed. And the goal is to actually support the, the other, the other individual, the human being. Um, so just wanted it to clarify for you guys this idea of the human service, more so um, to have a, a, a connection with the goal, with the, with the idea of if you are completing a human service degree um, with us or any other place that you go, in reality, you are opening your doors to all of the other fields. But we will talk about that in a minute in a more precise way so that there are no confusion. So there's a again, request, Gerardo, to turn on closed captioning. I don't see it in my menu. I don't know if you see it because you have control of the screen. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I think I have. That's, yeah, and wouldn't be, it would be in the Zoom menu. That's in the PowerPoint. Can you, can, can you see it now? Yep. There you go. Okay. So that's just a, a very quick um, uh, explanation of the human services field um, as a term itself. Um, we are focusing actually in the clinical side of it. Um, if you really think about it, human service will also embrace teachers, doctors, et cetera. But because we are in the clinical, in the counseling side, we are just gonna focus on those areas, okay? Every, for everyone to, to be clear on that. So, couple of the things that we do in our field, um, and this is kind of a general um, scope of practice that we, um, everyone in the field um, kind of has a responsibility to do. Um, and, and depending on the field, of course, but we always focus on all those um, standards that we need to follow. So let me, let me share with you that, for example, psychologists, social workers, counselors, uh, family therapists, um, drug and alcohol counselors, all of those different fields must have an understanding of how the human system works. And what, is, what does it mean, the human system, how we interact with other people. So this is actually a scope of practice and, and a standard uh, across all the different fields of the studies and preparations and, and professions within the human service and specifically in the clinical um, um, arena. So we all need to understand how we relate to each other. And with this understanding, we need to study how we communicate. Hence your course to enter to counsel or now perhaps your group counseling um, uh, class in which you are learning different techniques to, to communicate with others, perhaps paraphrasing, perhaps reflection of feelings, and all those different techniques that you learn. They are there because it's necessary for us to begin practicing a different way of communication in which we enhance the well-being of the individual that is working with us. Another one um, is it, it has to do with the way we um, um, the system, the systems work, the different structures that are within us. So um, let me just give you a quick example. As a school counselor, um, it is my responsibility to see um, how a policy perhaps that the district is implementing, implementing may impact um, the minority students. Um, um, this past year when, uh, um, when I was um, at the school, um, in my school there was not any neutral gender uh, bathroom and there was actually a, a, a and transitional um, um, male to female student, they needed that support. So 
part of our responsibilities is actually going in and work with the systems that are in place in order to support the well-being of the students. As a counselor, for example, um, if you know that your client needs to go to see a doctor and has difficulty actually accessing one, it is within our responsibility to outreach and support this client so that the barriers that are um, stopping that well-being can be removed. So we always also get a, a, an understanding of, of, of the systems that are in place and how can we actually better those systems for the well-being of the individuals that we work with. Yeah, so Another a quick example of that mm -hmm. might look like um, if somebody is, um, their primary language is in English, you might try to find a referral for a doctor or provider that speaks Spanish or provides Spanish-speaking services. <clears throat> or if you have a, uh, a client who is physically impaired and you want to make sure, and they're, maybe their, their mobility is, is limited not just in terms of um, their ability to walk, or, um, but also they might have a geographic limitation, like they don't have a car. So finding a referral that's close by. So it can span lots of different um, uh, considerations. So, so go ahead. And, 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 thank you, Oscar. And this is extremely important because in reality, all those abilities that we acquire, regardless of the, the specific field that you go into, they are actually similar to all of us. We always want to support the individuals by understanding those systems and supporting them to, to get well. Um, we also, as, as um, either as a clinician, social worker, psychology, et cetera, you want actually to work with individuals and, and, and understand the different techniques that are available in order to help the individual develop the skills necessary to cope, either with symptoms, to cope uh, with discrimination, to cope with um, a barrier that is inhibiting them from acquiring what they need. So we are prepared to support the individuals by understanding what techniques are out there in order to facilitate the development of the skills for self-awareness, for self-advocating, um, and we actually need to support them in their goals. So all of those are very similar in all of the fields that we'll, we will see in a minute. Wanna add anything to that, Oscar? No, oh, I think Okay. Well, do cool. handle it. So, um, of course, um, as you continue in your, in, 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 the, in the human service program, for example, with us, all the classes that you are taking or that will be taking are structured in a way that you acquire all these skills little by little. So that when you get out there in the field, you are prepared. And just as a side note, we, we are always learning. So once you finish your program, you will encounter that there is actually much more to learn once you begin working in the field. Uh, we are also developing a skills to assess, to evaluate, um, um, kind of a, a program analysis, uh, to think and, and, and to um, interpret if our intervention is working or not. We develop those skills and across the board in any of the fields, individuals working in the human uh, service arena, they need to have those skills to evaluate to assess whether the intervention is working or not. That is actually what's, um, what places us aside from other fields is that we can actually assess what we are doing in order to see if it's working or not. Perhaps you are taking my class and you are learning about goal settings and, 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 and the different ways of setting goals and, and then this process of reflection of whether that goal is, the intervention is working or not. So that is precisely why those activities are in place so that you can see that there is much more we can continue doing to support our, our, the individuals that we serve. Um, as in, in all the fields within the human service, they must, students, practitioners, we must develop our self-reflective abilities. We need to understand where, are we, where, where do we come from. We need to understand our biases. We need to understand our self-privilege, um, privileges actually, in order to support our clients or the individuals that we work with in, in a better way. So, 
the, the human service program in Great Basin College, for example, within all their classes or activities, they will um, invite you to reflect. And the, that this is precisely why, because you need to be able to understand how you are helping others and how your position in society, how um, your own privilege, how your biases may impact or influence the intervention in, in a positive or in a negative way. So that ability is actually part of that as well across the world with any other, pro with any of the programs within the human uh, service field. Um, another is, uh, uh, um, ability that we have across the board is this ability to communicate better with the individuals that goes beyond a friendly conversation. And, and this ability, as you probably have experienced it for those that have taken intro to counsel on or group work, those abilities are showing into, um, into those little micro skills that you develop to communicate. Um, we, for example, we, we practice the self-reflection, uh, um, uh, uh, paraphrasing, summarizing. Those abilities are, are not constant in our daily communication or our daily life. But when we are in this field, we develop those skills in order to assist the individual understanding what's happening to them. So this is kind of an, uh, a broad overview to let you know that in across the board, psychologists, social workers, counselors, etc., we all actually touch in those areas because they are necessary for the well-being of the other individual and for ourselves as well. So I always think about them as you know, starting from me and extending to my community. How do I impact other individuals? How the society impacts the individual, how the government impacts how the societal challenges impact the well-being of individuals. And we, uh, as, in, as individuals that work in this arena, uh, we need to develop abilities in order to understand how those domains of an individual's life uh, may uh, deter or, or may influence a positive outcome in their uh, own well-being. So with that, um, I don't know if there are any questions before I move to the next section. I wanted to make a comment. So we're talking about micro skills and, um, you know, most of you that are human services majors um, will be going into practicum next semester. And those skills are so essential. And it's okay if you feel kind of clumsy practicing them at first, then they will, they will come and take natural form and you'll get used to it. But they're essential across all healthcare domains, um, whether you work in, in the medical field, Paramedics, emergency medical, um, any of the any of our uh, sister, you know, uh, providers, <clears throat> because um, they they allow us to communicate effectively, um, succinctly, and and they also demonstrate a level of compassion that's really important when you're caring for somebody because they're so vulnerable. They're coming to you for help. Most people don't like to have to access these services unless they have to. You know, it's not a, usually a comfortable experience, um, especially in the medical field. There's all kinds of, you know, prodding and scanning and things like that. So um, these are usually taught <clears throat> in general across all the, the helping uh, service pr um, professions, in, including mental health, counseling, and the like. But um, what I want you to do is not feel overwhelmed, like we're introducing you to the skill, you have an opportunity to practice that in your practicum. You don't have to be perfect at it, but remember um, the education and training because that can carry you through into have a, having a more successful practicum. And, and that's um, something to, that, just keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be uh, right out of the gate. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it is effective. Thank you, Oscar. And, and I think that it speaks towards um, the need for us just to continue working on it constantly. And, and those are skills that are not um, a per se, as a lack of a better word, normal for our uh, normal communications. So of course, they, 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 they are going to be in a way weird for us to practice. So we always wanted to begin developing those skills uh, little by little, but they will come to you. Thank you, Oscar. 
So human service work, settings, where, where can you work with the, um, with the human service d degree? And not only that, but you know, in all the different um, sister fields, um, as Oscar mentioned, um, within all that we do in the human service um, umbrella. You can work in the schools, of course, you can be a school counselor, you can be a school psychologist, you can be a mental health provider in the schools, um, you can be a social worker in the schools, um, hospitals, um, you can be a, a clinician there, you can do the intake, you can be the crisis response counselor in the hospital, um, you can be the um, uh, psychiatric there is a new thing now in, in the counseling field. You assist psychiatrists in understanding um, how may, um, what the treatment may be in terms of, of groups or individual therapies. So you can actually begin assisting them too. Um, of course, you need a little more training for that, but just as a general comment, agencies, you can be case managers. You can support, um, you can be an intake person in an agency as a counselor. You can provide um, family and, and couples therapy in an agency, depending on the agency specialty. You can be a substance abuse counselor in an agency. So, um, I think I typed schools twice. I think I, I wanted it to say, actually, you can also work at the universities in their, in their counseling centers, et cetera. So you can, you can work for the government, indeed. There are fostering, um, a position, fostering parent positions that are hired by the government, which will require a degree in the different areas of the human services. Um, you can work at home, you can give therapy at home if your agency provides us services. Um, in clinics, you know, like um, I know that in the different counties there are clinics that will be um, supported by the government and they hire individuals to do case management, they hire individuals to do intake. So those are just few settings that um, come to mind when I think about the human service and the multiple possibilities that are out there. Um, any other one that you would like to add, Oscar, or um, I think? I guess I would like to, and it might sound kind of confusing, and there are actually, you know, even since I started my training in undergrad and um, you, you, start, you start to see new professions emerge. And I went to an education conference uh, where the head of education at Google was there. And what he was saying was, we shouldn't prepare people for specific job functions because the jobs that we're preparing them for don't exist yet. And so we have to keep an open mind and know that we are using the best uh, informed practices and research to prepare you um, for the field, but might look very different as uh, I think Carter was mentioning there's psychiatric assistance now to help people understand, um, you know, you don't, since the doctor's in so much demand, they have different um, supporting uh, professions and functions that are offloaded to them. Just like nowadays, we're seeing the emergence that never existed when I was uh, years ago, or our um, nursing, um, nurse practitioners and uh, physician, physician assistants, those things are coming under the umbrella of the, the licensed physician, but they have licenses unto themselves and they have their own roles and functions to play. So there's just a lot to um, understand. And while I, I'm sure as Gerardo's talking, it's probably getting a little bit confusing, but just keep in mind that that's just the nature of how wide uh, the field is. Um, and everything is changing. Everything's in flux. Industry's changing, you know, policies, rules, laws are changing. So as those things change, all the professions evolve and then new ones emerge. So another new kind of uh, support function is uh, peer counselors. Peer counselors have been around forever because that's kind of what AA does. But now we're professionalizing it. We're requiring specific training, a code of ethics, you know, all kinds of things to ensure that the quality of care is there. Um, so I guess that's all I had. Thank you, Oscar. And you know, as you were talking, it came to my mind, there are also um, 
uh, individuals working in, in, in um, nursing homes as a gerontologist assistance, in which you work with old people, um, elderly in understanding their needs, and some of them work with them in, in developing activities throughout the day in order to keep them um, cognitively engaged and also physically engaged. So the possibilities are just huge. So keep that in mind, and hopefully towards the end, um, this is becoming clearer how this works. Here we go. So what can I do with a bachelor's degree or a bachelor's in art or science in human services? There are multiple possibilities, and I think many of you have seen this before from our previous presentations. You can be a case worker, your worker, social service liaison, adult day care, life skills, instructor, social service aid, um, home health aid, and the possibilities are just immense. So all of this can be done with your bachelor's degree in human services, whether it's in science or in art. It's just, I guess, a matter of adding more math to your science one. So just wanted to give you a little example of all these multiple possibilities. So professional opportunities. Um, very general, um, we have psychologists, there are many others, um, to be honest, but I wanted it to give you the major ones because even within those, there are even more, and I will share with you a little more of that. So psychologists, counselors, social workers, family therapists, of uh, family and marriage couples therapists, as they want to be called, um, not only the family therapists, um, uh, all of those are kind of a, um, a, um, umbrellas of other specialties within their very own field. So in, for psychologists, for example, you can be a clinical psychologist, you can be a school psychologist, you can be a gerontologist, you can be a child development special, uh, specialist, you can be a psychoneurologist, you can be a forensic psychologist, you can be a social orga organizational psychologist. I want to bring your attention to something very important. Uh, our, our, our colleagues in this uh, psychology field are very specific in the training that they need to have. So while in in the human services, you can get your bachelor's degree and begin working as, um, um, say, behavioral assistant. For the psychology field, you must complete graduate degrees in order to attempt to call yourself a psychologist. And as a matter of fact, the only one that can be called a psych school psychologist without a doctor's degree is a school psychologist. The other ones, such as clinical psychologists, they need to have a doctoral degree in order to practice at that level. This is just what the APA or the American Psychological Association will grant them to be. Um, so, um, so it's important to know that to yeah to call yourself a psychologist, you this is a this class of identification is actually written into the codes of many state laws. And that's, you know, on the part of the APA um, lobbying to make those changes because they want to have a very specific identity. When you say, I'm a psychologist, that means you have a PhD in psychology. Now that doesn't mean you're a clinical psychologist. There's a difference between a clinical psychologist and a research psychologist, but they don't always um, make the distinction. But it's important um, because uh, they're trained, like Gerardo said, very specifically. There is a question um, that April um, brought up mm -hmm. under uh, the Q and A, and she said, and I didn't understand it at first, and now rereading, I understand what she meant. This degree will this degree be able? Will you be able to open a counseling business, counseling service? So, if you wanted to start an agency. Um, called, let's say, uh, ABC Counseling, and you wanted to have a number of services there. The business owner is not required to be licensed or even educated to any specific de degree. The providers, so let's say I you know, have a pile of money and I want to open up an agency. 
I go get a business license, I, I get a, an office, I get um, certification from the state that I've got all the requirements in place that allow me to see patients at this site. <clears throat> and then I start advertising and I, I hire Gerardo. He's a, a licensed clinical professional counselor and I hire him to handle the patients. Um, as, as the business owner, I don't necessarily have to be licensed. So what I would, the way I would answer that question, April, is that yes, you could, and it would give you enough kind of base information to understand how the business works. However, um, if you wanted to be, um, to, to, to extend that question out a little bit further, if you wanted to run a private practice where it was your, your business, so in this case, like I, run, I have a private practice in Las Vegas, my own, um, aside from teaching, I, I see clients in the evenings, and I'm the sole proprietor. I'm also the licensed clinician that provides services. Um, and um, this degree will lead you to the path to become a licensed provider. So in my case, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor and I have a clinical graduate degree. The reason I, I uh, make the distinction of clinical graduate degrees because most graduate degrees like an MBA is an undergrad plus 30 credits. Well, clinical degrees are Mine was, I think I had 71 credits when I graduated. So to me, it's kind of like a PhD because it requires that much schoolwork. It's not just two more semesters and you've got your uh, MBA, something like that. We also had to do a thousand hours of, um, of practicum uh, uh, clinical experience that had to be documented. So there's a lot more uh, requirements to become a, a, a licensed provider. And those master's degrees are very different from like I say a master's degree in finance or something like that. Um, hopefully that answered it and I'll let you get back to your presentation. So thank you Harada for indulging me. Yeah, sure. So um, as Oscar mentioned the clinical psychologist is the air is actually the specialty they will indeed uh, work as the clinician. A school psychologists have that ability as well in order to provide treatment for kids geared towards the learning process. So what are the needs in the learning process? What are the barriers? What can I implement in order to support the kid? But the school psychologists do not provide the um, intervention. The school psychologists create the intervention and give it to the teachers, especially teachers, in order for the teachers to implement it. So uh, just wanted to throw it out there. Gerontologist, you can actually become a gerontologist with a master's degree, but you cannot call yourself a psychologist of elderly. That doesn't work that way. Um, child development specialist, you can do that uh, with a master's degree, but that's not a clinical degree. Functions a little more like a consultant. Tell me how the kid normal development stages are. How does it look like? And you carry out a study of, of, of a population of kids that react differently. So it's not a clinical degree. Neurolo um, psychoneurologistics actually um, will allow a clinical psychologist to get a neuro um, training in order to do assessments on the different neuro needs, such as, you know, why I'm not moving my leg. Is there anything related to the brain? Mm -hmm. um, they are also trained in understanding the uh, MRI and how the brain works, but they need to be together, meaning they need to be clinical psychologists plus the extra hours, hours of neuro in order to practice at this dimension. Forensic psychologists, you may be called to court when they are, uh, you know, when parents are arguing about um, the, who has the custody of kids. So um, they are experts on the proofs and all that. So, but they are not clinical psychologists or they can be clinical psychologists with the extra training on forensics. So that's there too. Yeah, Social so not every, every psychologist is trained the same. So. In graduate school, if you decide you want to specialize, you want to try to get that in while you're doing it, or that might be postgraduate work. So you might graduate with your PhD or PsyD, which is another way of becoming a psychologist. Um, and um, somebody asked a question um, about what is gerontology. That's the study of aging and the process of aging. Um, these folks are very useful in um, convalescent homes, nursing homes, rehab facilities to understand as the body ages, as the mind ages, as 
um, their condition in life changes because when people age, uh, they go from being, let's say, the breadwinner to the to the patriarch and the matriarch of their family to to really having no assets, no job, and, uh, limited uh, mobility, li limited health. And there, those processes, um, as we study them and as our society deals with them, um, that branch of um, study and research is designed to con create considerations for those folks. So understanding that this, this person, as they age, might need have toiletry needs that they, toilet needs that they were able to do before, um, different kinds of medication or support services they might need, like um, physical therapy, so you might see a gerontologist working uh, side by side with, with the nutritionist at a hospital or a rehab facility to ensure those kinds of services are in place. Um, there are many subspecialties and professional um, licenses that the human services associates and bachelor's degree will prepare you for. But this is the base level stuff they want everyone to have. And it's, you know, you really need it. Um, if you decide that you want to go into psychology and you are sure you are 100% positive um, keep, keep in mind that you're probably going to want to major in psychology, even in your undergraduate, because that might inhibit you in certain graduate programs. Probably not because we cover theory and stuff in our program, but you definitely want to look into the programs, your, the graduate programs you're interested in. And Gerardo and I cannot possibly review the, you know, tens of thousands of graduate programs available. So, you know, narrow down your, your interests and then come talk to us and then we can help you further um, to make sure you, you're, you're on the right path. Correct, thank you, Oscar. So um, just once again to remind everyone, this is a panoramic view. And the reason why uh, we included the, the psychologist side is because there is also an option for you. It's out there, you are not limited. But as Oscar mentioned, if you are choosing psychology, you must start now. Um, yes, the human service degree that we offer in Great Basin does include psychology coursework in, in the associate's level. So that will actually allow you to move on to continue graduate school in psychology. But you need to check the specifics of the program, which includes actually reviewing the university of your choice, because they are so different. So it's impossible to summarize all of them. So. Moving on, counselors and family therapists, the different, um, um, and I'm gonna actually ask Oscar to uh, share with us the certification level, and, and I will move on to the master and the PhD. Okay, so um, looking at the substance abuse, um, there's a number of different um, certifications and different levels of licensure in the state of Nevada. Um, and I will try to, um, I'm gonna take control of the screen really quickly here. Um, request remote control, share screen. Okay, so looking at this, uh, somebody asked a question earlier, so I started to look at the drug and alcohol. So every professional licensure um, for the most part has a board of examiners. Lawyers have a board of examiners or the bar that manages um, and administers their license. Uh, medical um, boards, board of examiners. A lot of times people say board certified. You know, I'll hear a doctor say, I'm board certified. Well, you couldn't be a doctor if you weren't board certified. You're, you couldn't be a, a practicing medical provider, right? So you could be a doctor because a doctor is an academic title, not a, um, not a professional title. Um, a physician is more of like, you know, uh, but um, in terms of drug and alcohol counseling, um, the state of Nevada has a few different levels. They have what's called a certified alcohol and drug counselor. They also have a licensed um, alcohol and drug counselor. And then they have a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. And this is a master's level clinician that is both trained in mental health and substance abuse counseling, um, which they call kind of treating for co-occurring disorders. This is where I'm currently licensed at. And I also have the specialty license to supervise um, these folks as they um, move forward. So let's just take a quick look at the CADC, which is the Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor. Um, so here, here's what you need. Um, where is it? Proof of completion, just to get started. 
uh, okay. official transcript showing a completion of a bachelor's degree in an approved social science field from an accredited college. Now this is if you want to become a CADC, um, you, you have to have these first. If you want, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to have those completed. You could be on your way. Um, and this is what they call an intern. Um, where is it? Okay, here's an authorized activities for a counselor and certified intern. Um, it's no, still not showing me the education requirements. Um, but let's, let's focus on just the, the licenses so we don't get too far into the weeds here. Um, a certified alcohol and drug counselor essentially needs to have a bachelor's degree. Um, if you want to become an LCADC, you have to have a master's degree. And um, that allows you to deal with, like I said, co-occurring. So somebody with, let's say, a severe mental disorder like um, major depressive disorder and a substance abuse um, disorder as well. There's also um, a, 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 a excuse me a certified gambling counselor, which I am also. <laughs> I worked a, a lot of in the addictions field early in my career and and well throughout it. Um, and though they require a specific two specific courses in problem gambling, um, we do have those courses here, but unfortunately they haven't been filled, with, so we haven't run them for a couple semesters. But they are on our books, and if somebody's interested in in um, pursuing that field let me know and we can either do independent study or make the course available this semester you're interested in taking it. I just have to talk to my boss because she doesn't like it when there's you know, a small number of courses. We, we're trying to make sure we get the most uh, bang for our buck these, these days with the budget. Um, and then I'm trying to think, how do I stop sharing my screen? Did I? Am I still sharing my screen, Rorda? No, I see okay. you. Okay, okay. So um, you can go ahead and take back control um, so I can see your presentation because I forgot what else. Um, counselors, um, there are different levels of counselors. I want to speak specifically about um, what, what I call mental health counselors or LCPCs in the state of Nevada. They are called different things in different states. LCPs, LCPCs. Um, in the state of Nevada, we're called licensed clinical professional counselors. And that title is, is, um, means that you can treat just about every mental disorder. Um, just like a, a social worker could treat it, uh, a clinical social worker, just like an LCADC, which is a, um, also a psychologist, a psychiatrist. So we share a lot of these functions um, across disciplines because we're trained um, from our own perspective, our own, even a marriage family therapist can treat um, uh, mental disorders. Uh, and I, I know that's confusing to the public because they don't really understand like maybe who they should go to. Um, in the olden days, we didn't have these titles. They were all doctors. They were all MDs. And of course, what we realized is they weren't really trained very well in, uh, in these disciplines. And so the kind of help um, they could provide was limited, and so then these specialty fields uh, came about. Um, a sex counselor, <clears throat> that could be a number, a, a number of different things. Um, just remember, anybody who's just providing information, not necessarily a psychological or um, uh, psychological intervention or a counseling intervention per se, can just provide information that can be could what we consider psychoeducational. And just about anybody can do that that's um, well-versed in the material they're presenting. So sometimes you might see somebody say, I'm a sex counselor, and really what they're doing is providing information on sexuality, on relationships um, uh, with regard to um, sexual intimacy, but they're not really doing anything beyond that. Um, what you'll find is most people have very specific training that goes beyond their graduate level training or even their postdoc level training that they feel confident and they practice within their scope of practice. And that's a very important term. Um, the scope of practice is, means um, what you've been trained uh, to provide and to do so proficiently. So you don't want to just say, well, yeah, I'm a sex therapist, you know, well, maybe you had some, you know, education in college, but have you actually had supervised experience? So it's important that when you, 
um, decide that you want to go into a specialty that you get training from an accredited um, organization, you know, somebody that who, whose, whose reputation um, can stand muster. Um, and some training programs are great and they're not very well known and others are really well known and not that great. Um, so you kind of have to decide for yourself. The most important thing is, is if there's every, any kind of legal question about your qualifications that you can demonstrate that, yeah, that you've been trained here, that you have the information, knowledge, and the requisite experience. A lot of these trainings will say when you register to go to them, must be a licensed provider, mental health provider. Um, and it can be from various disciplines. So I'll go to a training, like I went to EMDR training. And I was sitting next to psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, drug and alcohol counselors, and then I was, I'm a LCPC, sitting alongside them getting that same training because we can all use that in our respective um, fields of practice. Um, career counseling, I don't know much about. I had one class in graduate school. I bet Gerardo knows a lot more about that coming from the school counseling field, so I'll let him talk about that. Thank you, Oscar. And indeed, career counselor, depending on the university that you are studying in and their emphasis, there are several courses you can take in order to be prepared to assist the individual in choosing a career. Career counselors are also higher in, um, at the governmental level in the employment office. You know, you, they can go to you and say, I'm an employee. So a career counselor can assess, you know, what are your skills, your abilities, and it can help you to actually guide you where you are going through. So uh, very useful feel. Um, uh, it's more so related to how much more training you can get in that field and that specific area. So um, counselors and family therapists, I, I wanted it to put it out there because uh, the degree and the courses you are taking in Great Basin College will open the door for a master's degree and beyond. So um, it, will, it will open up the doors at an academia or at the university to continue edu your education without any trouble. And just so you know, the um, classes that you get at GVC are is strictly designed to go hand by hand to a graduate degree level. So um, it's not going to be unfamiliar to you once you get to a master's degree level that what you study are those essential skills that you will continue developing in a master's degree. Not only that, the level of writing that we expect in our classes, um, the APA style, and um, in, in tech citation, all those things are gonna prepare you for a master's degree. And most master's degrees, not all of them, but most of them are a master's of science. And that means you're gonna be reviewing research um, and research invariably uses statistics to, to prove their or disprove their thesis um, or their uh, experiments uh, to remove bias. And our bachelor's program requires that you take stats 152. The reason I inserted that into the bachelor's program, so when you go into your master's program, you've got stats handled. It doesn't really get that much more complicated. It's just kind of a review of the same thing, but they apply it at a kind of a more of a master's level. So that way when you read research articles or you get into some of the experiments, you can recognize this is not a well-designed study and this research um, conclusion is not valid or reliable. And those things are really important when you start to look at the types of interventions that you might use. Now, I'm not gonna say that everything that is scientifically validated is useful. It, sometimes we, we have best practices that in, in fact are not the best, um, but other, other interventions have not been well researched. That doesn't mean they're not effective, it just means that we haven't proven them to be as effective. So as a provider, and that has been educated, trained, and has experience, you can take a latitude and say, you know, I'm gonna try this with this client because I've been effective and it it's, it's, has a good outcome. You don't wanna be kind of experimenting with your clients, but at the same time, we call it practice for a reason. We're practicing our profession. We are not, we have not perfected it because every, that means anybody, everybody that comes through our doors will be cured 100% and that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, and uh, so there are, there's a lot of things that we, we take into account in, when we're um, designing our programs. 
Gerardo and I go back and forth. Um, he, he lets me know, hey, I think this book is crap. I want to use a, a, a better book. And I'm like, okay, have at it. And, and he, he goes and talks to the publishers and we get a, a, a new title that, um, and I'll tell you, once you go through our, even our associates and our bachelor's program, when you go into graduate school, you're going to be well prepared. You're going to be like, yeah, I know all this stuff. And so it's going to give you an opportunity to grow and be confident when you graduate with your master's degree. So we're introducing it to you. Um, in the graduate program, you'll do a lot more research and, and study with, within those areas, specifically the foundations of psychological theory um, and um, psychological care, logical care that comes from theory. So, Thank you, Oscar. So yes, um, um, be assured you all folks that um, the program is uh, well structured to, to um, assist you moving on uh, at your graduate studies, if it does what so you wish. Um, so social work, I wanted to tell you that social work is a very fascinating field as it is extremely diverse. What does it mean? But it means that social workers, depending on the school and the program that you apply, has multiple concentrations. So you can be trained to be a, a philanthropic admin in a nonprofit organization, and that doesn't give you clinical skills. It gives you administrative skills, policy reviewing skills, and all that. So depending on what you want to do, you want to ensure that you are looking for the correct program. And how do you know what's the correct program? Go to the university webpage, see the curriculum, see what class they offer, see if it is fitting what you're needing. Everything that you need, it's there. So, and yes, you can work in a school, hospitals, and clinics. It just depends on what you are trying to do with the social work. So um, keep that in mind. And, and I want to make the, uh, a point that if you're interested in, in, in any profession, or any field of work, whatever it is, if you want to learn how to be a welder, you should be doing your own research. As, as um, seasoned professionals and um, academics, we're happy to be here to talk to you about some of uh, the options for you, what you're thinking, and run a bias, and we'll give you our informed response. But you should be doing your own research. Um, don't wait for people to give you the answer to what is going to be your career, your life. Explore that for yourself. And if you're really interested in it, you should find some kind of joy and fascination in exploring the field. Like, wow, I didn't know that, you know, neuropsychologists existed. And this is exactly what I want to do because, you know, I've always wanted to understand how the neurological interactions affect cognitive uh, thinking and, and things like that. So, that should be something that you're doing on your own, you know, it, and there's so many, um, we are flooded with information. So you can find information you're looking for. There's a great, um, many, um, ways to access that information from, uh, a college's website to let's say a researcher's blog page to YouTube videos that have that talk about specific kinds of research that you're interested in. So keep those things in mind. Um, it's, I don't want you to just um, wait for somebody to give you the answer, but maybe go and explore it for yourself and, and, and take that initiative. Thank you, Oscar. That is absolutely on point. Um, you guys need to invest some time in, in really reflecting which path do I follow? What do I want to do? How do I see myself in the future? Um, just very quickly, um, I want to show you in a summarized way the different degrees that may exist in the different areas. As you probably will see, there are bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD in most of them. I want to bring your attention, however, to the different licenses level depending on um, um, the degree that you're working at a master's level. So uh, um, a, a graduate degree, for example. So um, social work is a, a very unique field because it, they give you a licensure when you have a bachelor's degree. 
but even in that licensure, you must be supervised. So um, an example of that is, is, um, is in, within our program. You need to have your internship and uh, um, Oscar and I are the one that will be supervising you. So there is always someone um, that will supervise you uh, uh, at a level when you are in intern or when you have a bachelor's degree. You are not a solo practitioner. So keep that in mind. Another thing that I want to point out to you, psychologist. Psychologists are only called psychologists when they have a PhD. And they are only called clinical psychologists or psych, um, or, or when they had a psych D, this is a psychology degree, or a PhD. So uh, when they, and there are different ones, we review that. And remember, clinical psychologists are the ones that are very similar to the work we do, okay? Um, family therapists, um, they have the same thing. They are a master's degree in family therapy and in marriage, and they are PhD uh, focusing on that as well. The substance abuse counselor, uh, as Oscar was mentioning, um, there is certificate levels and licensures are the uh, CADC, certify, uh, um, I forgot what it stands for. Certified um, alcohol and drug counselor? Correct. Intern? Thank Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are different degrees that you can explore, different licensure levels. Just keep in mind, those licensure levels, you start with an internship. You will never practice by yourself after your master's degree. You will always have someone to watch um, on your shoulder. Um, after you have completed the required hours, then you can practice um, by yourself. Okay. Yeah, this is very similar to the process of like um, when a physician um, graduates from medical school and they go to what's called residency and they're in the residency for two years under supervision. And psychologists, they've gone to school for six years after their, gradu their undergraduate degree. So now they've been in college for 10 years. They have two years of post, um, postgraduate training and, um, they, and to get fully licensed as a psychologist, they have to go... Um, to a place that is matched, just like they might not stay in their hometown and practice at a site for a couple of years to get that final training. Um, so yeah, it's all of the clinical practices all require that because once you're licensed, you have a lot of power to do a lot of harm. So we wanna make sure that you have been um, monitored and supervised long enough till we think that you'll be a good fit for the profession. And that isn't to say that some providers don't, aren't bad actors as well. It, it happens all the time. And then we have, uh, the, that's what the board of examiners is there for, to protect the public against these licensed professionals. They can remove their license, they can sanction them, they can force them to go to trainings if they wanna get their license back. And I'll give you a quick example. When I was working uh, as a drug and alcohol counselor, I ran groups for um, nurses who had um, basically been found using drugs or alcohol on the job. Their licenses were revoked. They had to reapply for a provisional license and they had to come to my drug and alcohol class um, on addictions for like two years um, until they, and then they, then they were reinstated fully as long as they had completed the program successfully. So there's lots of ways that we can do remediation. Um, it, and it happens at all le levels. And um, the, the board of examiners has meetings uh, quarterly and you'll see people on the agenda that have, run afoul of ethics or um, um, laws and they're required to come and kind of explain what they're going to do or sometimes they're just their license will be revoked indefinitely but usually there's a means of remediation. Thank you Oscar. So I, I actually wanted to just to give you a quick uh, kind of an overview of some programs out there. This one is um, a program from uh, and, um, the University of Nevada here in Las Vegas. Those are the number of credits on the top that you will need in order to complete a master's degree in mental health counseling. All the different courses that you need to take in order to get that degree. So they need to be present. Um, just a quick, very quick example of what, looks, what it looks like when you go to graduate school and choose a program. Another one, um, 
I think this was from Alabama. Remember that the school psychologists can be called psychologists with an EDS, which is in a specialty degree in a school psychology. Those are the only ones without a PhD that can be called school, school psychologists. This is an example of a program of all the different classes they take. So um, just a very quick example for, for you guys to take a look at and see, you know, uh, those classes look interesting to me. So um, really quickly, I have another question. Uh, uh, Taylor is asking, <laughs> Do you know if there are national credentialing for substance abuse counselors or general counselors? Yes, there are. Um, however, they do not supersede state licensure requirements. So let's say I'm a, what's called an NCC, a nationally certified counselor, and I believe Gerardo is as well. Um, and what that does, is it, it, it demonstrates that we have a specific level of training and we came from a specific type of program that has encompassed uh, um, what are considered best practices and standards for counselors. But that doesn't mean I can practice in any state in, in the country. You have to, because of states' rights and, and, and state, you know, has, they, they are the ones that um, administer those licenses. So just like if you're a doctor or a nurse in Chicago, you have to apply to a license, become a, a practitioner in Nevada. Same thing for my license. Now, during COVID, this is a national crisis. They have relaxed those um, what they call reciprocity uh, conditions. And right now I could go across state lines and practice my profession without any, uh, without running afoul of the law. But or, during normal circumstances, um, you, you have to apply to the board of examiners of your discipline in order to be able to practice, uh, be a, a licensed practicing provider. Now, um, substance abuse counseling, they also have national, NADAC, the National Association for Substance abuse counselors, uh, addictions counselors, National Association of Addiction Counselors, um, have they have a national credential? But having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have to be licensed in the state you're going to practice in. I will say that our program, our associates, um, our certificate and substance abuse counseling, and our bachelor's um, in substance abuse in the human services and substance abuse counseling, meets or exceeds the NADAC requirements. And I did that intentionally. I reviewed. I talked to the folks over there and our, our courses and the syllabi all adhere to, to their standards. So that way, if you go to any other state to get licensed, you shouldn't have a problem at all, unless somebody changed something recently that I'm not aware of. But we reviewed all, and most state boards take their, their professional licensing standards from the, from the national boards. So we try to keep in line with that. Thank you, Oscar. So that, that, that was great information. So another example, um, a master in social work uh, example. This one is geared towards clinical work. So there are just different um, the individuals who are part of the social work field will come together, create the standards, and they will come up with the uh, coursework. Like I say, this specific one is geared towards the clinical work, but um, don't get confused. You may need to look at very specific programs and see what they train you in, okay? I just wanted to give you an example of how it looks like a program in all the different, in those three areas. So a couple of things to remember, regardless of what you choose, in the clinical world, you will need to complete an internship. So um, very generally um, speaking, you will need to actually a practicum in two internships, which is equal approximately to 700 hours in the academic requirements, meaning that when you are in the program, after that, in order to be a solo pr practitioner, and I'm just gonna take the example of Nevada, you will need 300 hours after you finish, your, um, 3,000 hours after you finish your degree of a supervised work. So you cannot be an independent clinician without having those amount of hours being supervised. So, and it's important to know that um, that supervised experience um, is required to become fully licensed. So if you're what they call a state intern, you're a, a licensed clinician in, let's say, as a, a CPC, a clinical professional counselor, 
you're under supervision for those 3,000 hours, which usually takes about two years. Mm -hmm. um, now, in our drug and alcohol counseling um, coursework, if you take the ba our bachelors um, and the associates as well, because that's kind of how our system is, our, our, our degrees complement each other. In Nevada, to be a drug and alcohol counselor, you need 4,000 hours um, of supervised experience. If you go through my bachelor's program or our bachelor's program, I wrote it, so I feel like it's mine, but it's not <laughs> mine, it's ours. Um, and that program, there's a, there's a, um, there's a um, an exception in the law. And it says, if you've taken X many substance abuse counseling courses, like in our program, you only have to do 1500 hours of supervised experience. It goes from 4,000 down to 1500 because they're saying you've had such specific coursework in addictions um, medicine that you don't require the 4,000 hours of supervised practice. You only need 1500 hours. So that reduces it significantly, gets you fully licensed quicker, gets you out into the field and, and practicing independently. Thank you, Oscar. So um, just remember that, folks, um, you do have an internship and practicum during your um, bachelor's degree, but that, you know, in your master's, you will still have those. Plus, after your master, you need to be supervised um, in Nevada for 3,000 hours. So there is a lot uh, to do in our field, but after you finish your 3,000 hours, believe me, you are so ready to, to do a solo work without um, a problem. So I just, um, I'm gonna post um, some of the boards that are in our, our, our state. That's the psych psychologist one, that's the uh, counselor one, and the gambling and alcohol one. So depending on the program that you are, you probably wanna take a look and see um, their um, requirements. Um, for everything. So as, as, as Oscar was mentioning, uh, you are responsible as well to go into those boards and find out all the information you need in order to be a, a, an independent practitioner, meaning without a supervisor. So take a look at them, see if anything works for you. Um, I am here to support you, to guide you the best way I can, uh, but I'm not, I'm not gonna minimize the need for you to research the program that, that you, um, want to study or want to go for, okay? Yeah, so um, a number of our graduates from the associates and bachelor level have gone on to become substance abuse counselors in the state of Nevada. They never have an issue. I run our, our curriculum through the boards. Um, they're aware of our programs. They, they're aware that they meet um, very high standards. And um, as Herodo said, you know, take a look at the board's websites, educate yourself, come to us with questions after you've informed yourself. Um, I know the past president, uh, Dr. Michelle Paul, I work with her at her agency, um, of the, the, psycho the psychologist board of examiners. Um, she, you know, she, write, she wrote the exams for those folks. Um, she's also um, a clinician at UNLV and a professor in residence. And so, you know, we have contacts and uh, we know people in the state that can help you if that's your interest. If I don't have the answer, I'm sure I know uh, someone in, in one of the disciplines that I have, Natasha Mosby, she's a social worker that I work with at um, the psychiatric hospital. You know, these folks are leaders in the field in Nevada, and we can always get you in touch with those services. But if you don't reach out to us, you don't um, have the enthusiasm behind your interest, you're probably not going to have what it takes to finish these programs. These are difficult programs. They require years of research, training, and experience. Um, you know, there's so many hurdles. It's it, sometimes it feels like you, people don't want you to finish. And so it's like, a, it's a struggle. Um, Gerardo is finishing up his PhD and it's, it's these, these things really force you to grow in unexpected ways. You learn frustration tolerance. You learn how to organize yourself. You learn how to become a great researcher. You, you, you learn how to be a great clinical writer. So all these things do hone skills and the, they might not have been what you set out to do, but to obtain that goal, you're going to have to master these um, areas of knowledge. And, and in that, you'll become a polished professional and you'll be competent to do what you want to do. Um, but it doesn't come easy. 
Um, but I think it's worth the effort if that's really what you want to do. What it does is it weeds out people who, you know, aren't that serious about it, who aren't willing to put in the time, effort, um, and serious training required. And we don't want those people to be providers. We want the best of the best. And this is why it's so hard. Just like becoming a doctor is not easy, a medical doctor. It's very difficult. And the people who wash out of medical school or graduate clinical programs, it's, there's a reason behind it. Maybe they, and that's not a bad thing. Maybe it just redirected their life in, into something else, something that they, they wanted to do. Maybe they want to make surfboards. I don't know. I, I like working on bicycles when I was in high school, but I don't want to be a bike mechanic for the rest of my life. You know, so you find what your, your passion is and you go with it and you don't let anything stand in your way and people will help you along the way to get there. I, I've written so many letters of recommendation for the board. I, I can show you lists from multiple colleges that I worked at and I'm always glad to do it for my students. But if you don't um, demonstrate your passion, your intensity, and your enthusiasm for, for this, it's, you're not going to make it. You know, and I just want to be really honest with you. I'm not trying to scare anybody or discourage anybody, but I want to be really honest and upfront about it. That is correct, Oscar. So uh, the, the energy and motivation must be intrinsic, must come from you. Um, and I'm going to also share that our field needs people. The, the, that is absolutely um, a reality, and we are going to continue facing it. So. Uh, there is job security out there, so in case um, that's a concern for you. Uh, so consider all that, and, and with that, I want to share with you the keywords in order to submit your assignment in um, Canvas. You just need to write purple, purple, purple on the assignment and submit it. Okay, that word is purple, purple, purple. Uh, with that, I'm going to open up for some questions, if there are any. Did you may have? And I'm, I'm just to working on typing a few of these, but I'll, since you stopped um, lecturing, I'll uh, um, answer a few of these here. Um, there's a question about, um, Shannon was asking, can we attend programs from anywhere you live? Um, at Great Basin, all the programs are online, so you can. Now, the, ex the exception to that 100% online is that you do have to serve at a practicum site over two semesters in your associates and two semesters in your bachelors. Um, now, and those are courses that are practicum, but you will be going to, let's say, I think Kim's on the call or on the, the meeting. She works at, um, where do you work, Kim? She works at Opportunity Village um, and she's doing her practicum there. She also works at Opportunity Village, but um, because uh, she has to have a different job specification for her practicum. She does her regular job there, then goes to her practicum at separate hours. Now, she lives in Las Vegas, but she does her coursework online, um, and so she can live anywhere. And we've got people, I think David's on the, on the, in the meeting. He's in, where are you from, David? You're in Illinois? Uh, I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> uh, David Reyes, he's uh, working on his, his, his uh, Bachelor's of um, Applied Science in human service substance abuse counseling. So, and I know he um, attends online, but also, you know, he'll be doing his practicum where he lives. Yeah, David's, yes, I am, he's from. Um, and then uh, Brandy asked, how do you supervise students when they are in different locations during our practicums? So when you're at a practicum site, um, you'll have a practicum supervisor. You'll fill out paperwork that assigns a specific person at that agency. And that person has to have, um, depending upon if you're working at a bachelor's level or an associate's level, they have to have the degree um, that you're working towards or above. So they can have a bachelor's or a master's degree and be your supervisor. And they agree to provide you with training um, for the, the, the practicum function that you'll be fulfilling there. And so they know, and then they'll do assessments on you um, mid-semester and final semester. And then I call them randomly to ask how you guys are doing, make sure everything's copacetic. Um, and the, other than that, <clears throat> um, they're the ones that provide the supervision for you. Um, and of course, as faculty, we're, we're available if you have questions or concerns during your practicum. Um, 
So hopefully that answered that question. Um, any other questions, comments? Yes, purple, purple, purple is the password. You put that in your assignment, you submit it, you're done. If you didn't come, and I don't know why anybody wouldn't come because it's a lot easier to sit here and listen to us talk than to write a, a two or three page paper. Uh, we got 49 attendees, it's probably the biggest practicum, or excuse me, symposium we've ever had. That's great, I'm really glad to see it. Um, Um, Emma says, I emailed you, uh, Emma's calling me out here. I haven't heard back yet. Would like to send me another email. Yeah. Send me another email, Emma. I'm blushing right now on screen. Um, I'm going to look for that email. There it is. Advising. Um, yeah, I answered you back on the 20th. So at 2 27 PM, Oh no, that was you to me. So you answered me back. I haven't gotten back to you yet. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to put that, I'm going to open that right now so I can reply to it by the end of the night. Is this assignment for uh, HMS 102? Gerardo, isn't it an assignment for HMS 102? That's your course. Yeah. It, it's, I just haven't published it yet. <laughs> okay. I have okay. To yeah. So you, that. you'll, you'll see it up on there. Um, um, Rachel, um, can you go into human services with a human service degree? Um, human resources, uh, human resources yeah. um, that's more like um, a business degree, an employment degree type of thing. Um, our human service is geared towards the clinical uh, field, uh, Rachel. So two different fields, uh, to my understanding, of course. When I read human resources, that goes there to the business field. Right. It, it is different. You could use those skills and, um, and tor in human resources, but there's going to be a lot more. We have a human resources program at the college. So if that's what you're interested in, I probably would do that just because that's going to gear you more towards uh, what you're looking for in terms of a career. Um, Any other questions, folks? Um, any okay. question, thoughts? Let's see. Okay, this is for you. This one's for you, Gerardo. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll read it to you. Um, when working as a school counselor, do you provide the interventions for the students or is it mainly the school psychologist? Um, it all depends. Um, if it's about the learning process that requires a more deep um, um, assessment, uh, say for example, the kid is showing learning disabilities, um, the school psychology will need to intervene and assess that uh, disability in order to to provide the, um, per se, the treatment plan that the kid needs to have. You as a school counselor uh, may support the teacher in finding out ways to meet those interventions um, and, and support the kid. Let me give you an example. Uh, perhaps the learning challenge of, of the reading challenge is due to the amount of noise in the classroom. You can support the teacher by helping the teacher find in a classroom that is uh, less populated so that the kid can actually grow and flourish in the reading challenge. So um, a school counselor, it's kind of a, this individual that will link all the services and will bridge the communication between teachers, professional, students, family, administrators. So you are kind of pulling pull for every single thing. Um, but you are not directly um, um, responsible for assessing the kid's need. Um, unless it's clinical, then it comes directly to you and you refer out to the community after doing some crisis intervention, of course. Um, so Emma, Emma, I responded to you. We have an, we're gonna meet tomorrow at 2.30 if you're available since I'm, I'm trying to schedule it right now through Zoom to make sure I don't forget. Uh, don't, if I don't get to you, just keep, just keep, give me a call, don't, no problem. Um, 
it's my job. Sometimes I get behind just like everyone else. Okay, okay. I see, let me see. Uh, okay, okay. Any other questions, folks? If you have any further questions, hopefully we answered them all. I know there's a lot um, of questions coming around in Wendover that I might not be aware of. Uh, Baroness is asking, the best thing to do, um, how are we on time, is to go to, let's see, um, to try to provide, find agencies in your area if you're not aware of them. Go to the county website, look at their, what they have available. Um, they usually have a list of social services or human services agencies that support the community because it's part of the, the county's job to provide to, um, those kinds of services to their residents. The other thing you can do is if you go to, um, you can just do a, a Google search of your zip code for human services, social services, drug and alcohol, depends upon what you're interested in. Um, I'm not from Wendover, so I don't know uh, too many places up there. But I know we've had a number of practicum students that have served out of Wendover. So they've found agencies to work with. Sometimes they end up going to the schools because the schools always have a school counselor available. That might not be your specific interest, but it is a good experience for you to practice your human services skills and, and get the experience you need. Very quickly uh, for Kim, uh, for the um, ABA or the behavioral analysis program, that's a, let's call it purist psychology field. So you want to actually look into the psychology field. Um, the human service will provide you some classes. So you, if you really want to say, for example, pursue the ABA, um, preparation. The human service will be helpful, but keep in mind that they will, um, as you continue advancing on that, will re they will require you to take very precise courses for that. Let me give you an example. They will, um, I think we have a course, right, Oscar? Uh, behavioral analysis. Uh, will yeah, but that is not really for ABA. It's, um, it's behavioral analysis in the context of Substance abuse counseling, <laughs> yeah, because no, it is but even that course will give you the foundation of what is it, what theories are used at the beginning. Um, you will find Pablo's there, you will have um, uh, a behaviorist uh, and all the different approaches to apply that. So the beginning of that course um, will be a foundation for you to understand what to look into it. But it is very psychological um, a field, um, ABA, so you probably yeah. Don't know the ABA has different tiers of providers. So you can practice as a with a bachelor's degree and you could use the human services degree with additional training. A friend of mine actually runs a, a behavioral um, ABA. She calls it, I think it's called Behavior University or something like that. She worked with me at the Autism Center, uh, UNLV, and she opened her own uh, training um, organization. And what it does is it allows people to be certified as um, there's different levels, so I don't want to speak like I know them all, but there's, um, but you could use this degree um, and with this, some additional training and, and become certified to work in that population. And, and ABA, if nobody, people don't know, let's say you're working with somebody with um, intellectual disability and they need specific training on pro-social behavior, and you'll use classic behavioral conditioning to get that. You'll do a kind of a treatment plan and um, set, state, state some, some clinical goals for behavioral changes and you'll kind of meet those. Um, it's very useful in different settings to schools and things like that. Somebody asked if the CPD passcode is the same. This, the passcode is the same for all the courses. It's purple, three times purple, purple, purple. It's hard to say fast. Um, if you ha get stuck or you're not sure, like Marinus is asking me about Wendover, um, give me a call. We can, we can figure something out. Um, because so, very, very quickly to David, um, can you do consultant work with a bachelor's degree in human services? 
I'm going to tell you, you can do consultants work with, uh, with almost everything that you study. Um, just yeah. keep in mind that some agencies may look for that consultant to be highly experienced. So indeed, right. you, can, you can for sure do that, um, David. Um, so I'll give you an example of some consultation work that I did. We had a residential treatment program open up and they needed their policies and procedures um, to be written out to meet the standards for the state of Nevada to become a rehab center. Um, this is a drug and alcohol rehab center, um, residential. And they, one of the things that they, they require to open is having um, somebody on their um, administrative staff to be licensed. In addition to that, I wrote their, P, um, their policy and procedures, their PNP, and they paid me a very generous consulting fee to do that. And you could do that with any license at any level, really, um, because I wasn't providing uh, clinical, uh, clinical services. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for that. And a lot of times you'll know those inside and out. And so agencies or organizations will hire you to do that kind of work. So there are questions about practicum and folks, uh, we, we are gonna have a, a, a meeting for the practicum individuals and all those questions about it will be answered in that meeting. Is that happening in two weeks or one yeah, week? Yeah, so um, just, I was, that's a good thing you brought that up. So. We have our practicum and orientation. That means if you're gonna take practicum at some point, if you're gonna take it next semester, you have, to you have to come to this meeting, it's required. If you can't make it to the meeting, it will be uploaded to YouTube and you can watch the video. Um, but you have to have done it. Um, Although and, I'm highly, highly encouraged, the ones that are continuing to just attend. Yeah. Because in that moment, it's a good moment to ask questions, to clear any doubt that you have so that you can continue. I know right. it's going to be posted. Yeah, it's I on attend. November 4th at 5.30. Um, mm -hmm. And I will we'll send reminders out. We'll send um, announcements out so you make sure you come. But, it, you know, put it down on your calendar, November 4th, 5.30 to 7. It's going to be a Zoom webinar. You can ask. I'm going to go through a presentation on practicum what it looks like, how do you get into it, um, what's expected of you, all, I'm gonna go over the syllabus, everything. And so you'll have a really good understanding of what you need to do. But in order to, after your first semester, if you're in, in the associates program or the human service certificate program, in your second semester, you should be starting practicum one. If you don't, you're gonna get behind, you're just gonna take you an extra year to graduate. So um, pay attention to that. And if you have questions about it, you can always give me a call, um, but look forward to going to that um, that uh, field experience orientation meeting on the 4th, November 4th at 5.30. Um, Thank you, Oscar, with that. It, it, it has been my pleasure, um, folks, to share with you a little bit of our human service field. If you have any other questions, I'll reach me, I'll reach Oscar. We are here to support you. And I will see you then on November the 4th yeah. for our practicum um, internship uh, webinar. Thanks everyone for your questions and thanks for coming. Um, it's great to connect with everyone again over through the webinar. Uh, give us a call if you need something. Thanks. Good night.